Are we good to good? Uh, thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, I hope you've had a great week so far. Uh, our speaker tonight is uh, Josh Littlejohn. Josh is one of the UK's leading social entrepreneurs. Uh, he's the co-founder of Social Bites, which is a social enterprise in Scotland uh, with a mission to eradicate homelessness. Um, social Bites started off as a small chain of sandwich shops and shot to global fame uh, when Hollywood A-listers such as George Clooney and Leonardo DiCaprio visited the outlet. Um, so could you please all give me a warm round of applause uh, to welcome Josh. Hello everybody, how you doing? Thanks so much for having me, it's a real honour uh, to be asked to come here. I was asked to kind of sign the book upstairs and I was thrilled to see I was two signatures away from Stormzy. I was like, yes, that's <laughs> awesome. Um, so yeah, so I'm just going to talk for about half an hour or so and just kind of tell you guys a bit about my story, my journey, um, a bit about our work uh, within the issue of homelessness uh, and then hopefully have about half an hour uh, for questions. Um, so I'll kind of start with... Um, when I was kind of your guys' age, um, I went to uni, I studied politics and economics. And my original ambition, I wanted to go and work with the government. Um, so I envisaged myself maybe being an economist, working for the Department of International Development or something like that. That was kind of my aspiration. Um, so I left uni and I applied for a graduate scheme job um, with the government as a civil servant. And it was, I'm sure if anyone's in their third year and they're thinking about this kind of thing, you'll know these graduate scheme things can be quite arduous. Um, so this one was a six month long application process um, and you had the different te psychometric tests online and all kinds of things. And I got through to the second last stage of that process, um, which was a days long assessment center in London. And they, this was like a days long uh, assessment of your kind of knowledge of economics and your technical knowledge if you wanted to be an economist for the government. And before going down, they recommended a textbook that was about that thick um, for this uh, stage. And I was so determined to get the job, I read the book back to front. Um, and I went down and I passed that stage. And then I got right through to the very final stage. And um, that was more of a test of your sort of personality traits. And there was things like your communication and your teamwork and your interpersonal skills. Um, and I, after that six month long process, I got a single sentence email and it just said, sorry, you've not been successful, you didn't get the job. So I was a bit kind of gutted um, to have passed on the technical bit and fail kind of squarely on grounds of personality it was a bit depressing. Um, so I thought, you know what, maybe I don't want to jump through these hoops anymore. I might try and set up my own business. So I brainstormed different business ideas and they all seemed to revolve around events. So I decided maybe I could set up my own events company. Um, so I set up an events business and I called it Capital Events based in Edinburgh. Um, so I started to brainstorm different events, ideas and things I could do. Uh, and the first event that I ever dreamt up was a fashion show uh, that I put on during the Edinburgh Festival that I called the Festival Fashion Show. Um, so to put that into a bit of context, I was 21 at the time and I was single and I thought a fashion show might be quite a good uh, opportunity to chat with some girls. Um, so that was that, I did that. Um, and then I started brainstorming other events and I was doing exhibitions at the big exhibition hall and I did a big business awards ceremony um, and I was really relishing uh, this entrepreneurial process of kind of coming up with an idea and seeing it become a reality. I was, uh, found that to be an absolute thrill. Um, and during the time I was running this events business, I came across a book by a guy called Professor Muhammad Yunus. Um, and this guy is an amazing man, he won the Nobel Peace Prize, um, he's based out in Bangladesh, and in this book he described an idea that he called a social business. So he talked about how in his native Bangladesh, he's set up over 50 different companies, and some of them have gone on to become really large billion dollar businesses, but he's never owned a single share in any one of them. So every single business that he ever created was never um, for the traditional purpose of trying to maximize a return for himself or for investors, but he kept on seeing these social challenges in Bangladesh, and his solution every time was to try and create a business format to tackle that particular problem. So I was reading this, I thought, wow, and it really kind of rung a bell with me that you could um, be entrepreneurial and try and set up your own business, but do it for more of a social mission. Um, so. I was so inspired by this book that I decided to write off to Professor Eunice um, and I said I was very inspired by your book, I wondered if I could come and meet you. Um, and I don't think I got a response but I was quite persistent, I phoned up somebody in his office and um, 
eventually they said, okay, if you want to come and meet him, he'll be in Bangladesh in October, so you can come here then. So this was back in 2011. And so I said, okay, great, boot me in. So I travelled out to Bangladesh um, in October 2011. I met with this man, Professor Yunus, and spent a week there and toured around his different social businesses and found this experience so inspiring that we thought, let's try and go back to Scotland and set up our own social business. Um, so at the time with my little events company, I had a little office in the centre of Edinburgh, uh, and we used to go out most days and get a coffee in, from Starbucks or get a sandwich from pret a um, So we thought maybe if we could set up a cafe in this kind of marketplace, but it had a social mission, then maybe customers might choose us. So we opened up this little sandwich shop in the centre of Edinburgh, managed to sell uh, my events business, and I got £40,000 together, opened up this little sandwich shop, uh, using that money, and we called it Social Bite. <coughs> so, the original idea was quite one-dimensional. We wanted to try and make a profit, and then we'd chosen three different charities to give the profits to. Um, but ultimately, we are just, um, I set it up with my colleague Alice, and we were just two young people who wanted to try and do some good. Um, so I was 25, I think she was about 22 at the time. Um, so we were both kind of very naive and decided, let's open up this salmon shop. The original idea was to try and make a profit, and then we'd chosen three charities to try and give the profits away to. So it was quite a one-dimensional idea, and it certainly didn't have all that much to do with homelessness when we first got started. But ultimately, we just thought, let's try and do some good. So that was it. We were opened up the shop. We were in there the first week or two making sandwiches and serving customers. Um, and we ended up meeting this young man uh, called Pete, uh, who was 19 years old. Uh, he was homeless, and he was selling the Big Issue magazine on the street corner just outside the shop, basically just outside the front door. So we kind of got chatting away to Pete, and he'd come in um, some days, and we'd give him a free sandwich at the end of the day. And after about two weeks of being open, Pete came into the shop, and he kind of plucked up the courage one day, and he asked us if he could have a job. Um, so we kind of thought, well, why not? You know, we're only here to try and do something good, and that seemed like a good thing to do. So we gave him a job in the kitchen. And I remember that we offered him a job for about 16 hours a week. Um, but he was so determined to make this job work uh, that he wanted to work for that 16 hours, and then he offered to volunteer for another 16 hours. And just that employment was incredibly transformative for him to kind of come in literally out of the cold into something in the mainstream made a big difference. So <laughs> when that worked out, we asked Pete if he knew anybody else that was homeless that might want a job. And he suggested his brother, Joe, uh, who was also homeless, also selling the big issues. So we said, OK, so he took his brother on. Um, and then when that worked out, we said, guys, do you know anybody else that's homeless that might want a job? And they said, no, oh, there's a guy, John, um, sells a big issue, might be quite good. So we took him on. Um, and when that worked out, I think at that point, they kind of realized we were basically total soft touches and they could probably get jobs for their mates at this stage. Uh, and they said, come to think of it, you might want to have a think about Colin. He'd be good, so we took him on. And almost by accident, we were employing about four or five people who had all been in a situation of homelessness. Um, in this little sandwich shop. And that kind of got us engaged in the issue then. Um, and we started to <coughs> think more about it and we decided to introduce this pay it forward system uh, where customers who were coming in to get their own lunch and their own coffee could buy something ahead for homeless people to come and get for free later. Um, so people were coming in and whilst they got their own sandwich, they'd maybe say, can I have an extra sandwich or I'll buy a cup of coffee or uh, buy a soup? Uh, they would pay for that additionally and we started to invite homeless people in to get that for free. And again, almost um, before we even really knew it, we were feeding about 40 or 50 people a day in this little sandwich shop in Edinburgh. And we started to speak to these people and, and ask them their stories and ask them how they became homeless. <coughs> and. I guess we, as a lot of people would, had a bit of a preconception that homeless people maybe ended up in that situation because they got involved with drink or drugs um, and got addicted to something or something like that. But we kind of became a bit spooky, really, because we kept hearing the same story fed back to us. And typically, people suffered pretty traumatic childhoods and suffered abuse when they were kids. Typically, people. Um, grew up in the care system and kind of got bounced around that system and let down by it and typically people became homeless in their late teenage years. So when we kept hearing this story basically on repeat it became really apparent to us right from those early days that homelessness wasn't so much an issue um, about individual decision making but it was a very systemic problem and depending on what cards people were dealt when they were born um, they were almost predestined it seemed to us to end up in this pretty desperate situation. That kind of gave us a great sense of motivation to do as much as we could in this issue, and 
and we started to um, take it in different directions and, and kind of think quite entrepreneurially. So firstly, we started to expand these shops. We opened up more shops in Edinburgh. We opened shops in Glasgow and Aberdeen uh, in different cities throughout Scotland. Um, we opened up a big central production kitchen. Um, we opened a restaurant in Edinburgh. Um, and the model became that roughly a quarter of our workforce would be people that have struggled with homelessness. Um, and we would give out this free food with a pay it forward uh, system. So now Social Bite employs 110 people and roughly a quarter of those are people that have struggled with homelessness. And throughout all these shops we give out over 100,000 items of food and hot drink every year. So it kind of reached a scale beyond our wildest dreams really. Um, and we, yeah, as we said, we were helped um, by you know some famous visits. With George Clooney dropped in for a sandwich um, in late 2015 and caused a complete bonanza. Um, there is there. So, um, so I'll tell you a little story before I move on to some of our more ambitious work, uh, and then we'll get on to some questions about a time when it didn't quite go so according to plan. Um, I think it's good to highlight um, some of the difficult management challenges you face uh, running a business like this, and it's never too good to paint uh, too rosy a picture. So I'll tell you a story about a guy that we employed called John. Um, so this was about three years ago um, in Social Bite. We had a bit of an issue in the business with theft. Little things kept going missing. Um, so one day, £20 went missing from one of the tills. Um, a couple of days later, £10 went missing from uh, somebody else's wallet. Um, a few days later, somebody's iPod went missing, and we thought, somebody must be stealing from us. So there was a few people who we kind of suspected it might be, um, but this guy, John, he was just such a nice guy, he didn't even really come into the equation of our thinking. But after about a few months passed, the coincidences kept stacking up in whichever shop John was working in, um, that's when things would go missing, and whichever shift he was roted on for, that's when things would go missing. So it kind of reached a point where we kind of thought, you know what, this has to be John. We didn't really have any evidence, but kind of it was the only logical uh, person it could have been really. So one day I decided to go in and try and bluff him a bit and force a bit of an admission. Um, so I went into one of our shops in Edinburgh where I was working and said, John, can I have a word please? And we went and sat in one of the booths and I said, look John, something I've not told you, I've not told anybody, is that we've had covert cameras um, put in the back of the shop. And I said, we've caught you on film stealing from us and stealing from your colleagues. I said, if you admit it now, then there'll be no consequences and we can support you with whatever it is you need help with. I said, if you deny it now, then there'll be some really quite serious consequences. Um, and John was sat right opposite me, looking right in the eye, and he said, show me the footage. <laughs> he said, if you have footage, uh, show me it, because I promise you, it wasn't me. He said, you've given me this chance. I would never betray that. I swear to you on my life, it was not me. And I looked him right in the eyes, and looked right back for what must have been 15 seconds. And I remember I went back to the office that day and said, it's definitely not John, 100%. I said, he didn't even flinch when I mentioned the cameras. He swore in his life, said, not him, must be somebody else. So anyway, a couple of weeks go by, and one of the things we do a lot in Social Bite is corporate catering. So we do lots of sandwich platters for businesses and board meetings and things like that so this particular day we had a few events on and the manager asked uh, john if he would drop around some sandwich platters to a law firm uh, around the corner so that was fine he dropped them off the next day alice was phoning around different uh, clients uh, to get the feedback on the food and the order so she phoned this particular client and said hello i'm just phoning from social bite i just wanted to make sure everything went okay with your order yesterday and the receptionist said yeah you know the food was really good but one little problem is that the other receptionist who was working yesterday her mobile phone's gone missing so we think whoever's dropped off the sandwiches has stolen her phone so i thought oh, that little fucker it was john so i sort of marched into the shop and said john let's go for a walk and we went and sat on a bench and Princess Street Gardens and I said you took that woman's phone and you lied to me and initially he sort of tried to deny it and then he got uh, a bit upset and then he kind of admitted it all and what came out then that we hadn't known before is that John who's in his late 30s at that stage um, had developed since the age of 16 he developed a really uh, serious gambling addiction and um, so everything he'd been taking was going straight into Ladbrokes straight into the roulette machines and the phone within 24 hours had already been pawned and the money had already been gambled. So at this stage we're kind of faced with a bit of a difficult dilemma in terms of what we do. Um, certainly my instinct and a lot of the advice I was given at the time would have obviously been to sack him. Not only 
um, was the trust kind of broken with myself but also with his colleagues and it seemed like almost an impossible situation to repair. But where it gets a bit more tricky is that when you are trying to do something like this and take people into the workforce who have traditionally been very marginalised, then you have to, where you can, try and sometimes understand their behaviour within the context of the lives that they've led. Um, and you have to, where you can, try and put yourself in their shoes. So John, um, his story is not dissimilar to anyone you'll meet really from a homeless background story, and he gave me permission to share it. Um, so John, from the age of um, zero till seven, this was his kind of journey, um, when he was born to when he was seven, he didn't live with his parents but with friends of his parents who were drug addicts and alcoholics. Um, him and his two siblings got uh, locked in a small dark room. They got given a bucket in the middle to do the toilet in and they got fed porridge oats and that was his life as a baby from zero till seven. At the age of seven there was a house fire. One of John's siblings died in that house fire. John and his other sibling got taken into the care system. They got bounced around different children's homes and foster homes and at the age of 16 he becomes homeless. And I started to think, man, I can't even begin to put myself into this guy's shoes. And then you start to think, if that's been your childhood and you've had none of the love or the nourishment or the care that most of us take for granted, and you get to 16 and you go into the bookies and you bet a bit of money and you win and you get that first kind of buzz of joy and adrenaline, then what kind of addiction might be possible to take hold of you? So when this was happening, we were trying to think about what to do here. I heard a quote at the time from a guy who runs a similar kind of organization in the States, um, a guy called Father Gregory Boyle. And I found this quote really profound, and it really kind of stuck with me. And I try and let this kind of sentiment uh, inform myself and our senior management team when sometimes we're faced with these kind of dilemmas. And what Father Gregory Boyle said was, what we need in society is a compassion that stands in awe of the burdens that the poor have to carry rather than in judgment at the way that they carry them. And I found that really quite profound and when I started to stop and think about John and all these people I was meeting from a homeless background, my only rational response really could have been awe because I genuinely concluded that if it was me that was dealt their cards or, or walking in their shoes, I wasn't confident I would still be on my feet, let alone trying to turn up to work every day, trying to get my life on a different path. Um, so to conclude that story, what we did with John was we decided to suspend him for three months. We helped him find a local Gamblers Anonymous group, um, and he started to really relish that, and he started going along to that every week. We also kind of realized at that point that the job alone wasn't enough, and we had to kind of provide support around it. So we teamed up with a local charity who started giving us a counselor once a week, and John and lots of the other guys started getting weekly counseling, which made a big difference. And then after um, a week, uh, after uh, three months, we repositioned John out in our central kitchen, and he went on to work solidly there for a good two and a half years without incident. Um, and then he actually went on to, and in late 2015, uh, along with five guys all from homeless backgrounds, to, to have the privilege of cooking lunch for uh, George Clooney. So he's the one just next to George there. So kind of had a bit of a Hollywood happy ending. And he went on to move on from Social Bite, and, and he got a job in quite a posh uh, hotel in the centre of Edinburgh. Um, which is ultimately our aspiration for a lot of these guys as they go and move on and get a mainstream job. Um, and I think when he got that job, they asked me for a reference. And I don't think I mentioned a lot of that stuff, but um, he's, he's doing really well now. So. so that was kind of our journey over the last six years. Um, and over that time, we got so much support from people from all walks of life in Scotland that it really kind of uh, led us in different directions. And, and, and one of those directions was that we... Um, decided to try and do something ultimately about the issue of a home or accommodation um, because it was getting increasingly frustrating just to be giving out food and uh, trying to offer some jobs. So we decided to uh, pioneer a bit of an accommodation model. So we approached Edinburgh Council and asked them if they had any vacant land that they could give us um, for us to try and develop a, a project where we would build a small village, which we called the Social Bite Village. Um, so. Edinburgh Council granted us this land and we managed to raise some money uh, and we started to put these houses into production and they're beautiful little two bedroom houses. I think hopefully we've got a photo. Um, you could put it up or I could click it. There we go. 
Um, so this project just launched in May. Um, so we managed to raise a, almost a million pounds um, to build this to build this um, village. And the idea is that it's a really supported community for 20 people to get out of either sleeping rough or living in a really stigmatised homelessness system um, into a beautiful little house that looks Scandinavian little houses. And um, there's a big central support hub. Um, where people get lots of support on site and get helped into employment, helped into uh, the local college um, or education opportunities and generally just kind of helped onto their feet. Um, and that project launched in May at the moment. There's 13 people living there. There's nine guys, there's four girls and there's a little dog called Coco, like a proper friendly little dog. Um, so yeah, we're hopeful that can be a, just a different model for how we respond to homelessness. Um, and again, for that project, we were overwhelmed uh, it was almost a tidal wave of support that we were receiving um, from companies in the construction industry or members of the public donating to it. And when I started to think about all this support that we as a small organisation were getting, um, and I compared that support with the statistics of homelessness in Scotland, um, and we did a bit of research into these statistics, and we learned that there was about 11,000 homeless households throughout Scotland, if you take a snapshot. And if you break that down city by city in the biggest cities, then in Glasgow, it's about over 2,000 people just will be homeless tonight. Uh, Edinburgh, it's about 1,500. Aberdeen, it's about 500. Dundee, it's about 400. So I was comparing these numbers to all the support we were getting. Those numbers suddenly didn't seem all that big, and it occurred to me that a small country like Scotland, but the same logic applies to England or other countries throughout the world. If we have a collective focus and a collective energy and we shine the political spotlight on it, um, there's absolutely no reason we couldn't create a country where no one should have to be homeless. So it was on that basis we decided to try and create a big event uh, which ran in December last year. Um, and I've got a little video um, of that event which I can play now and you can see what that was all about. Um, and then, yeah. <laughs>
So, um, so yeah, so 8,000 uh, 8, people came together that night uh, and, and gave up their beds. Um, if there's a God, he must have a sense of humour because it turned out to be the coldest night of the entire year. It was m minus six. Um, my mum did it and she's already said to me, don't ask me to do it again, I'm not doing it again. Um, but those people, they collectively raised £4 million um, and that's been invested in a range of ways that helped us complete that village project. Um, but also it allowed us to start speaking to different landlords uh, in Scotland and started to really try and make some really significant changes in this issue. So we started to say on the basis that we could help to fund a wraparound support for people, would these different landlords, typically city councils or housing associations, pledge mainstream flats for homeless people uh, to get their own place? And we started to get flats in off the back of the profile of that event um, and pledges came in in different cities in Scotland. Um, to the tune that now there's been over 830 mainstream flats pledged for homeless people and they start to be released this month um, for people that are currently sleeping rough to get the keys to their own flat and wh what a lot of that money will raise uh, raise that will go towards is providing a wraparound support um, but in order to fully m reach that scale um, and for that program to really create longer term structural change we had to really use that event and a lot of the focus um, as well as a lot of the focus that stuff like the George Clooney visit and the DiCaprio visit and everything else brought to lobby the government and try and change the politics of this. Um, so about 10 months ago we asked the Scottish government on the basis that we would invest three million pounds of the monies raised in providing a support for these 830 people. Would they put in four million and would they put in some million uh, money additionally uh, in the third year to help embed it into our political structural responses for the different local authorities. So we asked them that about 10 months ago and I'm not used to bureaucracy and I've found the whole process of dealing with government very, very frustrating. Um, but just about a week and a half ago, the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon just announced that their big conference, um, that um, that was her giving out bacon rolls um, at the sleep out. Um, but she just announced at the big conference uh, that her party did that the Scottish Government would be investing £6.5 million pounds into this programme um, which over the next 18 months can help 830 people out of homelessness and more importantly help shift the politics of the issue and really start making some big inroads. So, um, you know, it's been a real whirlwind uh, journey for me over the last six and a half years since we set this thing up. So I'm keen to try and convey that to you guys with a message really that you can all go and change the world. You know. You guys will be leaving here way better educated than I left, um, you know, my, my degree. Um, and, you know, in my experience, if you want to go out there and make changes and influence things and change things, then you can. Um, and people will buy into that. Um, so on that note, I will finish um, with a quote. Um, I always finish these talks with a quote from Steve Jobs. Um, and I used to always read this quote, but I've given this talk a few times now, so I've kind of know it off by heart. And that kind of home, hopefully will some sum up that message that you guys can take home and then happy to answer questions. Um, so Steve Jobs said, um, when you grow up you tend to get told that the world is the way that it is and your life is just to live your life and try not to bash into the walls too much. But that can be a very limited life. Life is much broader when you discover one simple fact and that is that everything around you that you call life was made up by people that are no smarter than you. And you can change it, you can influence it, you can build your own things that other people can use. Shake off this erroneous notion that life is just there and you're just going to live in it versus embrace it, change it, make your mark upon it. When you learn that, you will never be the same again. And that's true. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for, for that speech, John, uh, Josh, and uh, I think I'll just have a couple of questions from me and then I'll open up to the wider audience, uh, who I'm sure will have uh, quite a lot to, to comment on that. Um, so uh, what, what, uh, what sort of made you decide to, to sort of found Social Byte? Uh, and also you listed as a co-founder, so what help did, and input did you get from other people to revise it into the, the way it is today? Um, I mean, I think like we were, so sometimes like naivety is quite a good thing because you just go in and you make just different decisions. So we, like I can't overemphasize how naive we were when we set up that sandwich shop and completely clueless, like and inexperienced and, uh, you know, even just the notion of trying to run a food business and a hospitality business, we went in and just kind of learned as we went along. Um, and, you know, that allowed us, I guess, to make decisions like to employ the guy that was selling the big issue. 
um, outside and sort of you know adapt to, to things that, as they came up. Um, but uh, you know, I suppose in some ways I, I do kind of feel like we've either been extremely lucky or there's been some kind of divine intervention at play. Because um, I feel by all rights, like Social Bites should have definitely gone bankrupt at least 30 times, you know, over the years. Um, but there's just been a series of little miracles, you know, to, to dotted over the, sa the last six and a half years that have kept us alive and, and allowed us to do what we've done. So. I think naivety for us was a good thing and we just jumped into it two feet and just took every little step one step at a time. I think that's a bit of advice I'd give to people um, is just to take things one step at a time. So we, there was never any big vision behind any of this. We never thought at the start, if we could do this, then maybe George Clooney will come or maybe we could build a village one day or anything else. It, it was literally somebody asked us for a job um, and we took it literally one step after the next after that. Uh, speaking of little miracles, um, what do you think it is about the work that you've done that uh, alerted people like DiCaprio or Clooney um, compared to some of the other good work that other people do as well? Well, in fairness, um, we approached them, so they, like we've sort of PR'd it quite well um, in the sense that we made it look like they flew across the whole world to come and have a sandwich. Um, but. Um, we wrote off them and we approached them and at the time through my events company I was organising this big dinner in Scotland called the Scottish Business Awards, um, which is something that I, I had set up um, and it became quite prestigious. Um, but basically how that was set up is I just created this event and I called it the Scottish Business Awards. And because it was called the Scottish Business Awards, all of the businesses and entrepreneurs in Scotland kind of assumed it was really prestigious and it had been around for a long time and we just didn't correct them. So we managed to like create this quite big dinner. So the approach to Clooney and DiCaprio, and we had speakers before that that included Bill Clinton and Richard Branson, um, was to invite them to come and be the keynote speaker at this dinner. And we, we were able to, through that dinner to make a big donation to their particular foundation as an incentive for them to come. But what we did with Clooney um, was we said that we have uh, this little sandwich shop, Social Bite, you know, would he be happy to come into that as well? And he said yes. Um, and yeah, he arrived and there was about 200 women who had been camping out since like six in the morning and just going berserk. Um, there was like, a, it was like the scene out of Notting Hill where the guy opens his door and it's like just mad paparazzi. It was like hundreds of paparazzi. There's a Sky News truck there. Um, so for us, as this like humble little sandwich shop, it was an insane day, um, and yeah, you know the same thing happened with DiCaprio. But we sort of effectively made that approach and made that happen. Um, we got a, vi a visit from Prince Harry and Meghan Markle uh, just before they got married. They came to us. We got an email saying they'd like to come and visit. So that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, typically again, it's something that we you, you, we've reached out to people. Thank you very much for that, John. Um, I really like the video, and uh, I think the, the sort of experience of rough sleeping was a really good event, and it's something that is quite common in Cambridge where people try and do it. And how, how, what methods do you think we could get to encourage more people to uh, participate in it, to experience what it is, what's like, what it's like to sleep mm. rough on the streets? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're this year we're doing this sleep out event in four cities in Scotland. Um, it's taking place uh, four cities in one night this year and then in December 2019 we've uh, got some aspirations to maybe try and take that event and do it in lots of towns and cities throughout the world um, so yeah maybe we could try and work with Cambridge Union work with you guys to do one uh, December 2019. <laughs> I'd definitely like to get involved in that. <laughs> um, uh, on sort of a more somber note, uh, the number of rust sleepers in England has actually increased uh, for the past seven years in a row. Um, what do you think is the main sort of reason for that? Um, I mean, I think that it's so far down the Conservative government's priority list, really, that it's basically you know, that's a direct cause, it's just not a political priority. Um, I actually got invited um, for dinner at number 10, uh, right, on Burns Night, I think they're trying to, any Scottish people that are doing something, you know, that's relatively high profile, they invite you on Burns Night, whatever, so, again, I was kind of disagree with a lot of the policies and everything else, but it's quite flattering to get a letter to, like, go to number 10, and you can't really turn it down. But I got massively criticised in Scotland from loads of, like, Twitter, just went mental, because they knew you sell out. Um, so anyway, so I went along to this, and I was actually ended up sat next, but one to Theresa May, so I was able to like speak to her about homelessness. It was a good opportunity, but again, she just wasn't really 
clearly. I mean, I guess you've got Brexit and everything else, but it's just not really high up in the political agenda. Um, and I think the other reach, so obviously there's other factors like austerity, there's universal credit, and there's these uh, policy factors at play that, that undoubtedly create homelessness. Um, I think the other main thing for me is that we do as a society, not just in England, Scotland, all the local city councils, we spend an awful lot of money on this issue. We spend a lot of money putting people up in hostels or homelessness bed and breakfasts. And there's a lot of money wrapped up in the issue around people that are homeless, typically are also in and out of prison on short term sentences. And they're getting uh, caught up in, with police time. And if they've got addictions, they're in and out of hospital a lot. So all that costs a lot of money to society. Um, so I think it's not necessarily that we're not spending the money on it. I think we're just spending it in the wrong way. Um, and I think that if we, there's, there's other examples throughout the world um, particularly countries like Scandinavia, a country like Finland, for example, has pretty much eradicated homelessness. They used to have a homelessness problem not dissimilar to the UK. Now they don't, um, so we know there is policy decisions that can be made, and if that money can be invested in, in the correct strategies, um, th then we can make an, a difference in it, and we're just not doing that here. Um, on a more student front, what, what could we as, un as university students be doing to either raise awareness for or tackle the, the issue? I think um, I was gave an interview with a uh, student paper just before, and I sort of said that um, an important thing for me, and I'll give a quick example first, is with, with our, our village project. As I say, there's 13 people living there now, and I was down there last week uh, showing some people around the project. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that the staff there, they don't wear uniforms and they don't wear lanyards. Um, and when, so when I was showing those guests around, it was basically indistinguishable um, to the, you know, even to me, who am not there all that often, which people were the homeless people, which people were the staff, and which people were the volunteers. It was just people in a nice place. Um, but I think if you are in a situation of homelessness, that is not your reality. You are different. You are sub everyone else. It's very much us, and it's them. Um, so I think a common thing that homeless people report is that they just feel invisible, they just don't even feel like they exist. So I think a big thing you can do, which doesn't cost you anything, is just to acknowledge people, say hi, have a chat, find out their story, ask them how they became homeless, and I think just treating people like a human being makes a massive difference. Uh, and then I guess look at the local charities here that are uh, doing something, and also put your brains into it. That's, that's the one thing that I've learned, is that the reason we've been able to achieve all that is because I've woke up every day and thought about it. You know, I've not really thought about trying to make money. I've not really thought about anything else, uh, you know, work-wise, other than this. So my creativity has gone into this. So I think, like, you know, I'd encourage you guys when you go on and graduate or, you know, when you do extracurricular things here, you know, put your brains into it. That's the biggest thing you can do, definitely. So you touched on it sort of being uh, an issue with mentality. So uh, I think it's, there is a stereotype that maybe um, some homeless people uh, are sort of drug addicts or maybe spend, if you give them money, they may spend it on alcohol yeah. or cigarettes. Um, how much truth do you think there is to that stereotype or and what work could be done to address that? I think the, the, the link between homelessness and addiction is very, a very interesting one. Um, and I think that a good example is like that sleep out event. I showed you that video. There's 8,000 people doing that, including a lot of the big highfalutin business people. We tap into the corporate market, a lot of the chief execs, all the top people. At least 60% um, of those 8,000 people had smuggled in a hip flask. It was a dry event. Everyone was smuggling in whiskey and alcohol just to get through one night. Um, and I did the sleep out. And, um, you know, it's cold, but you think it's only one night you get through it. Um, the time that it really struck me was the next day when I went home and I got a shower and I got changed and I got back into my flat. I thought, Do you know what? I couldn't really imagine doing it again the next night or the night after that. And then when you learn that the average time that people spend homeless in the UK is between 18 months and two years, I thought it would not take me long at all to turn to drink or drugs or any form of escape from that like grim, depressing reality and the cold. Um, so I think there is undoubtedly a link between homelessness and addiction, but the cause and effect of that is more often than not the reverse of what people presume. People presume that people get addicted to something, then they become homeless. More often than not, they become homeless and then they turn to some form of escape. Um, so, you know, whilst it's true, if you give someone money to someone begging, they may spend it on drink and drugs, but I think until as a society we can set ourselves up where they've got appropriate 
options and we can help them out of that situation into something that they can sustain, you know, I, you can't really begrudge them of that, in my opinion. Uh, regarding the point about um, cause and effect, now, in your experience, what's the most common cause for the people you've interacted with to become homeless? Well, we actually commissioned a study um, on this, so we kind of had some idea anecdotally from speaking to people. We commissioned a study from Harriet Watt University around the statistics of homelessness in Scotland, um, and as well as the statistics, um, they looked at the root causes, so they academically analysed scientifically what causes homelessness and the different variables at play um, and what indicators would indicate someone to become homeless. And again, if you ask the average person, you know, what what would be the causal factor of someone becoming homeless, most people say addiction, you know, but the number one reason, the causal indicator of someone becoming homeless was childhood poverty, which is exactly what I was saying um, in my talk, that it all stems from childhood, it stems from the cards you were dealt stems from your economic situation, stems from suffering trauma, abuse, uh, and just generally not having a safety net. And I think that you know m most of us can relate to that. Like for me, for example, if Social Bike goes bankrupt and I you know get depressed and suffer mental health issues, realistically, the worst case thing that happens for me is I go back and live with my mum, probably. Um, you know, and most of us have supportive parents or supportive networks or extended friends and families. So I think the reason that people often become homeless is, is, is a lack of safety net um, and if they're already on the, the poverty line and you don't have a safety net then you know that, that's typically the reason. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, so on a more sort of Cambridge uh, specific note, in, in a town of such wealth and privilege, um, what steps do you think um, the university or university institutions uh, can take to address this issue? Because homelessness is a very big issue in Cambridge. Um, I think for me it would be twofold. Like one would be um, encouraging the students to think creatively about it and, and put their thinking into it. Obviously there must be so many in, insanely intelligent people um, at this university. You know, flash will get me everywhere. Um, but you know, to get people's brains on it, um, I think the reason that homelessness, the statistics have increased at, generally in society in the UK ar around homelessness isn't so much about resource for me, it's about focus. I think homeless people um, are just routinely ignored, either literally as we walk past them or politically, as I say, they're not a big priority. So I think getting students to, to think about it. Also, you know, obviously there's a lot of wealth in the university and, and money, and you were telling me about, you know, the, the different assets that this as a university owns. So I guess you could look at the different charities working locally, try and foster a sense of collaboration and, and, and perhaps support financially as well, you know, I would guess. Thank you very much for that, John. Uh, so I think that's it from me. Uh, if there are any audience, uh, any audience questions, please just raise your hand and wait for a steward to bring a microphone to you. So does anyone have any questions for Josh? Yes, just yeah. Hi, thank you for coming to speak with us. In your talk, you mentioned um, sort of governmental actors, partnerships for your fundraising, and then also private citizens who had donated or companies that were sort of interested in the project with building a village. In what ways do you see yourself as situated um, as part of a sort of private movement to address homelessness and affordable housing as compared with one that more explicitly collaborates with governmental systems? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think, um, you know, initially we were just entirely private. Like we just sat, did our own thing totally, you know, had our sandwich shops, giving out food, giving the jobs, did that village. There's no public money at all went into the village. All of our thinking was just private. Like, l let's do what is within our own control and our own hands. Um, and we fundraised entirely privately, you know, through events like these sleep outs. Um, we did a big campaign at Christmas where people could buy a homeless person Christmas dinner and that raised lots of money and that was all just private individuals chipping in five pounds so we were all private and there's a power in that because you don't have to I think it's easy sometimes for charities or individuals to just always point in the government and say you know you're hopeless you need to do more about this I think there's a certain um, power in saying well what's stopping us and that was the whole thing that inspired me about Muhammad Yunus's philosophy is that that's how we should be directing our entrepreneurial brains 
is to take the power of tackling social issues into our own hands. And we don't have to rely on government. We can take the power in our own hands and, and, and put our creativity to it and, and do something that addresses it. I think ultimately, though, when you are dealing with it, you know, many societal issues, you need government, you need local, you need national government if you're going to make any meaningful, sizable inroad into it. I think you can chip away on the periphery um, and make a massive difference to lots of people, but you're never going to get wholesale uh, change um, without changing the politics. Um, so I think in one way or another, you have to create influence um, with government. Uh, and it's an easy, a thing easier said than done to, to get your voice heard. So for us, the game changer for that was when 8,000 people gave up their beds and slept in the cold because that, when that happens and they do that in minus six, then that became, becomes a political mandate and it becomes a compelling factor for a government to say, okay, the public want us to prioritise this issue. Um, and I think certainly with the government's financial commitment of six and a half million pounds in Scotland, you know, that will make, make a sizable inroad that we could have never really done privately. So, uh, you know, my opinion is you need both. Um, and, and certainly you should start just doing things privately because there's a bit of power in that. But as you truly get stuck into an issue, you, you probably start need to influence in government as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, just get in the middle. Um, first of all, um, you went. I think you went to McLaren, and like yeah. you're known as the most important like person that ever went to McLaren. Did you well go to done. McLaren? Yeah. No way. <laughs> this is a tiny state school in Scotland, by the way. This is not some weird private school like thing. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, I wondered. So you were talking about the care kind of. You thing. must be like the only person from McLaren that's ever made it to Cambridge. That's awesome. Second. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I was um, I was wondering like the care issue and like where mm -hmm. do you think like what can be done to stop that kind of like fallen in from the care system and just almost straight into homelessness like what's the gap there yeah um again that's a good question it's something i'm not really i don't have an answer to it they're, in scotland they're doing a review of the care system and there's a woman in charge of that called fiona duncan who i believe went through care as a child herself now she's a successful kind of woman in this sort of area and i'm encouraged by that review because what she has said and it's i guess a strange thing in a way when you think about in the context of politics but what she said with this review and how she wants to try and create reform in the care system is put love at the center of it and you know when she said that is a bit you know love and politics it's just never that word doesn't really go in with like political policy but if you think about it we're talking about young kids um that for whatever reason aren't living with their birth parents um you know and they've maybe suffered abuse and I think like that is the root cause of all this stuff that is hitting us later down the line is just a total lack of love you know they're not getting any nourishment any care and they're being bounced around the system uncared for and if you get to 16 17 and you're kind of cut adrift you know from that system and you haven't built up that toolkit which is given to all of us largely through love and um, then you know the chance of you becoming homeless skyrocket um, so, you know, I don't have the answers to how that system will be reformed, but I feel like that's a, a good place to start. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Um, I just wanted to ask, from your experience working with charities and also working with governments and directly with people who are homeless, if you have money, what's the best way for you to help someone? Because I feel like I've heard a lot of different opinions on this. So some people say, like, it's better to donate to charity. Some people say, but like, if you go to charity, why not donate directly to people who are homeless? And then there are also other people who are like, instead of donating money to them, it might be better to just give them supplies or like offer to buy them a hot drink or mm. like a hot meal. So I just wanted to ask from your experience, what's the most effective way? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know. It dep I guess it depends which charity you give it to. Give it to Social Bite. We'll invest it wisely. Um, but yeah, it depends which charity you give it to. You know, I think... You do get charities where the chief execs paid crazy money and the, it, so much of it goes on overheads and you know they're kind of saying don't give it to them give it to us you know we'll make sure it gets to them um you know so sometimes i think you're better just giving the homeless person a bit of money and they might spend it on drink or drugs but until we have the reform that i'm talking about then you know and I'm, I'm certainly not adverse to that but i think what i would say to that is your best to sort of do your diligence 
on, on local charities, find out what each of them do, see which one connects with you, and I would by and large say try and give it to, to a charity, and, and, and more often than not give it to a smaller charity because it will go further. I think you know your money can make a bigger difference to, to a small organisation. There's lots of little grassroots charities um, where a little bit of money can, can make a big difference. Thank you for that. Uh, yes. Um, obviously, you started off as one coffee shop and or one sandwich shop, coffee shop, and then expanded to another one and another mm. one, and then you built a village, and then you've organised a huge deep out. You're not someone who likes to kind of keep it as it is and like mm. say I've done enough. So what? plans are there for the future? Um, well, this is the thing. So, um, basically, I kind of, I'm a bit conflicted because I always kind of want to say that's enough. You know, I wanted to just re rest now and just think, focus on something else. And like I've always said that throughout this whole time, I've always said if I can just get the sandwich shops going, then that's it. I'll be happy then. And then it was like, if we can just get this village built then, you know, I'm done. And then it was like, if we can just do this big sleep out and manage to get 8,000 people, and then now it's like we're doing four sleep outs in like one night, like, we'll just do these four. And it's like an addiction where you want like the next biggest hit kind of thing. And um, so I think for me, like, uh, once we've completed this Housing First program and this 830 people, um, I think that potentially can be as big a contribution that we can make to the situation in Scotland. And hopefully after that, we can perhaps just be more trying to influence political policy um, and we don't have any more aspirations to, to, to build another village ourselves. Um, I think we've potentially got some aspirations to do a big one-off uh, event in December 2019, like I was saying, uh, that expands in lots of cities throughout the world and raises money for homelessness charities in those cities and maybe more international refugee-focused causes. So i kind of got my eyes on, on a big international event. And then after that, I would hope um, that I could try and put my focus on other stuff and, you know, hopefully have a family and, you know, try and just not be obsessed all the time with the next thing because I think, you know, that that's only half a life, really. So. Thank you. Yes, just here at the front. So you mentioned, um, with the example of John, the guy who had like antisocial tendencies of the theft and stuff like that. I was just wondering, um, sort of how common was that experience with, with homeless people who you employed and stuff? Did that get in the way of their work a lot? And also, what is the solution to that? Is it, is it basically therapy, or is it just a general feeling of acceptance or you know, numerous things? Yeah, um, I think we, we've not had too much issues with theft. You know, that was pretty rare on theft, but we've definitely had lots of issues you know, with employing people from this background, um, you know, you name it, really, we've had an issue with it. So we've had people fighting in the store, like we've had employees fighting with like homeless people coming in for free food, because um, homeless people coming in for free food were trying to like take money from like the donations jar or something, and then there was a big scrap, like, oh God. Um, we've had people like storming out mid shift because they couldn't take it. We've had, um, people not showing up at all for work, you know, people just going off the radar. People that have gone strong and never causes an issue for two years, suddenly something flares up and, and there's an issue. So um, it's a challenging, very, very challenging thing to do and that's one of the reasons we've got no real aspirations to expand the shops beyond their current scale because as I say, we've either been lucky or there's been divine intervention. but. We, the stars have aligned for this thing to, to work and I, I think if we were to try and franchise this and open up a hundred shops you'll get a lot of them shutting down because you need a lot of commitment uh, and a lot of luck really for, for that to stack up. Um, I suppose the one thing that we've learned really is that a job is so important and like you guys will find this as you, you leave academia. Um, Without a job, you know, you need that sense of purpose. It gives you a regular income, it gives you friends, colleagues, network. There's so much that comes with a job. Um, but if it, you're employing people from this kind of vulnerable background, it's not enough on its own, and that's what we learned. Um, and that's where we started to invest in a bit of a, a structured support around it. Um, and now we've got a more of a um, program for people that are coming from homelessness into employment where they start on just part-time hours, they build up their support, they get a weekly meeting with that support worker, so on and so forth. They get counselling, they get specialist 
posted to specialist areas. So I think, as with anything, if it's someone who suffers from any kind of challenging needs, then the job or the house or whatever it is, if it's coupled with the support, then that tends to be the thing that makes the big difference. Thank you for that. Uh, any more questions? Any more? Okay, that, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your time, John. If you could all join me in giving John a very much.